Hey guys, Mike here, and welcome to another episode. It's Q&A time, and the reason it's Q&A time is because I'm in between projects and uh, I thought I'd answer some questions whilst I was waiting for parts. So first question, just gonna get straight into it. What's going on with the 1990 Renix, the, the 4.0? It's soon to roll into the workshop and right now it's just sat in the garden covered in snow. But if you remember, I blew the front diff up on the diesel, had to nick the spider gears out of that to get this thing kind of running in the meantime because I was using it. But some spider gears are on the way and uh, also, a new harmonic balance is coming too. In fact, that should be here tomorrow. And thus begins its adventure with a flipping angle grinder, basically. I'm gonna to have to cut up all the floor pans and you know take out all the corrosion, weld new plate in, and then I'm gonna wrap the line the inside and get nice and painted, and then see about maybe doing a paint job on the outside and just kind of get it in a nice condition so it's a decent shell to start building off of. But obviously the main thing's really just to make sure the issues with the engine are sorted and uh, you know, just get all of that kind of stuff done. But it runs great. I do have another project in the meantime. It's the 1992 Arctic Cat Cheetah. In fact, I just finished repairing that and it was running great. Me and Max were out on the lake tearing along on it. We had a really good time and um, the engine runs brilliant. The 440 Suzuki engine, it's, it's a decent engine and the whole snowmobile runs really nice. But um, unfortunately the chain went in the gearbox when we were out in the middle of the lake and we had to get a bit of a recovery to get us back onto land again. But um, I was thinking about driving that in here in the meantime, and doing a few episodes on getting that restored because uh, it is something I use from time to time. But um, really it's down to you guys whether you're actually interested in seeing anything on snowmobiles. I know there's a lot of diehard XJ Overland guys on here, but you know, out in the winter here in Sweden, when you've got a meter of snow, sometimes it is a bit more sensible to take a snowmobile. So I think I might get out on that and do a camp, but be interesting to hear some feedback. And as I always say on this channel, a lot of the things that I film on because I'm trying to drum up content, a lot of it's just what I'm doing already. And I just film it because, um, you know, I'm already doing it. Uh, so, you know, just the way the channel has always been. But the first real question comes from Darren on Patreon. Hi Mike, I was just tugging one out watching your recent long version compilation of your winter trips. He goes on to say that, because it's a massive comment, he, he enjoyed the pigeon hunting content on the previous videos, you know, on, on the MCG Bushcraft channel. And is there a possibility of me doing anything like that in Sweden? Um, well, Darren, it is on the cards, mate. But the problem being is that Although I speak Swedish, my Swedish is of what I would call like a basic level. Um, to take the hunting exam here in Sweden, I need to learn Swedish fluently really, because the hunting exam in Sweden is quite tricky. I need to learn about the anatomy of almost all wildfowl and a lot of the animals and species that are here in the country. And, uh, and then I take an exam and, and I have to get a very high score on that exam. And after that, then I'm granted the, the opportunity to have a firearms license. Um, there is another way, which is to be a member of a club, but it's actually more difficult than, than doing the hunting exam. So although I am training at the moment on an app to do the hunting exam, um, there's still a lot of vocabulary in that that I don't know and I'm having to learn. So I would sort of forecast that it's probably another year before I'm able to take the exam and then I would be able to bring my guns that I have a license for in the UK, from the UK, over to Sweden and transfer them here. But to be honest with you, I probably will just sell my firearms in the UK and reapply here. It's just easier. It's a bit more of a longer process. Yeah, I do miss hunting. It was a massive part of my life. I mean, I've hunted from the age of 14 all the way up to three days before leaving Sweden in 2008 in May, 2018, sorry, in May, when I, when I came over to Sweden. I still get, when I go back to the UK, I still occasionally go shooting, but in all, all honesty with you, a lot of the videos that you've seen me um, hunting in in the UK, they, those locations just don't exist anymore. I wouldn't be able to shoot there. So it's, you know, it's nostalgia really for me, but um, yeah, I will hunt again. It's just gonna be some time. So the next question is um, from a lot of different people over the years, um, you know, there's more than one comment. It is, why don't I drive a Land Rover Defender 110? I get this question all the time, um, really from right, right back in the early days as well. And my theory on that question, well, let me start here. There, are, I think there are two types of people who drive these kind of vehicles. 
um, you have these sorts of vehicles as an interest, like four-wheel drives. I think there are four-wheel drive builders and four-wheel drive buyers. And the preferences in which vehicle you choose is going to be really different for that kind of for, for those kind of people a four-wheel drive buyer who just wants to buy a vehicle maybe based on how it looks or its reputation or its capability their needs for a vehicle are going to be completely different to someone who's a builder of a four-wheel drive who, who enjoys building a vehicle and goes i can see the potential i can lift that i can swap the axles on it i can do this i can do that i can weld this to it it's, it's two very different ways of thinking so the difference being is someone who chooses a cherokee to build it into something like the, what i've built mine into which is a way more capable vehicle than a defender now than a stock defender anyway um it's gonna, you're gonna see the potential of the vehicle very differently to someone who buys a Defender and just keeps it as a Defender that's stock. So getting that out of the way, like looking, looking at a Land Rover Defender 110, um, the, the reason I think somebody's asking me that question is because I'm British and they can hear that I'm British and they're thinking, why is there a British guy with an American vehicle? Um, why isn't he driving a British vehicle? The other point of view might be, I've got a Defender 110 and I think it's the best vehicle in the world. Why don't you think it's the best vehicle in the world? You know, it's difficult to kind of get a grasp at why that question's being asked, but I'm guessing it's for one of those reasons, really. Now, my, my honest opinion on Defenders um, is, is I just don't like the look of them. Now, I grew up in the UK and um, I saw Defenders every day of my life gr growing up in rural South Gloucestershire. And it was mostly because I'd either be shooting on farms where farmers would have them as utility vehicles, my mates would have them and we'd go to off-road things and, and do events together and stuff and like take part in pay and play sites. You know, me and my friend Lawrence, well, Lawrence Smith, he bought a, uh, Land Rover Series 3 when we were like 17 and, and, and it was 300 quid and we just drove it around the forest and ragged the hell out of it but back then you know that was just the way what they cost they were their utility vehicles you know they're not they're not like really expensive high luxury vehicles and they certainly don't drive like that either you know it is a utility vehicle so you know a Defender to me has never been like Sorry, I've got a really itchy nose. I've got, to, I've got to sort this out. A Defender to me is, has never been like a luxury vehicle, but like when you look at the prices now, they're worth a lot of money. And I don't think they're worth a lot of money because they're worth it, is my personal opinion. I think they're worth a lot of money because, um, you know, that they're just not being made anymore. And it's the same reason everything becomes expensive. So I, I personally wouldn't want to spend that kind of money on a Land Rover Defender. I have driven them many a times. I used to drive a Defender 110 to work um, every weekend when I worked as a bushcraft instructor in the Forest of Dean uh, for Forest Bushcraft. And that was, the, that was the company vehicle I picked up in the morning, loaded it up with kit and took it off to the forest. And it was great for it. You know, it was a great vehicle. Um, uh, personally, I just, I'm just not a massive fan of them. And I think that's okay. Now it means, I, it doesn't mean I don't like Land Rover or I think Land Rover is shit. I think Land Rovers are nice, you know. And I've seen some really nice looking Defenders that I would consider to look pretty good actually for a Defender, but in my opinion. But, you know, like if I was gonna buy a Land Rover, it would be a Discovery. It would be like the Discovery 2, for example. Like that's a vehicle to me that I think is much nicer than a Defender in the way it looks. I think it drives like a normal vehicle, so you can do long distance drives in it. Like if I was going to go to the North Cap and back, which is like 5,000 kilometers or something from where I am, you know, if I'm doing that in a Discovery 2, it's going to be a lot quieter. And, and that makes a big difference when you're doing long distance drives, because, you know, the sound of the vehicle, that hot, constant roar, if you've got bigger tires and like the clattering and everything, you know, it, it does kind of wear on you. And um, you know it can it can be quite draining and tiresome on on long trips on over over a week or two. Um, that's just my personal preference. You know there'll be people out there that can that can handle that and they don't care. You know and they're happy to drive a Defender and they love their Defender and I'm happy for you. You know what I mean? But they're just I just they're just not my kind of vehicle. The only thing I'd say about Discovery Two that I think that I don't know and maybe you guys can help me on this is can you turn off traction control? in the Disco 2, because um, in the snow, 
it's a big hindrance that traction control because it's spinning wheels everywhere and, it, and it's it doesn't allow for that that finer throttle control that you really need when you want to just really crawl along in the deep snow and not like punch through as soon as that tire spins and all these tires are trying to do things it's um it, it can be a bit of a problem really but that's why i don't drive a disco you know a land rover 110 i'm just, it's just not my kind of vehicle really i just don't like them i appreciate them for what they are um but um I, I think they're just very expensive for what they are and for what you're getting you know there are other vehicles out there that that i'd much rather have over that vehicle another question i'm getting asked a lot and i'm getting asked this on instagram too and this is from finn zan fur 1961 i bet he likes a bit of fur probably got the full outfit what's the name of your front sway bar disconnect system called it's called rj's quick disconnect system i believe and it's from rj's desert speed shop that's that's the chap um i was dealing with and he's the guy who builds them um, so if you want to contact him, his Instagram is in the link below. It's probably best to DM him on there. Um, but he has a YouTube channel as well, so you can contact him on there. Um, another question is, is like, how is that working out for me? It's working out great. It's, it's a really nice system. You know, obviously I just get out the car, I turn the switch and I'm done. And it does allow for full articulation. It's, it's an awesome system. Mine's still a prototype, so he's actually refined it even more since he's built mine. The things that connect to the sway bar links, I don't know what you flipping call them, but he's made those even thicker. And it takes some abuse too. You know, sometimes I'm just ragging it down the, down the dirt roads and, you know, the suspension's going like this. You know, and the, and the torsion bar is, is giving in so you know I'm, the hub hasn't failed yet even when i've left it connected and articulated onto an object so you know all of the the, the tension is going into the torsion bar so it's pretty solid it's working really well anyway aldan001 says what is the total weight of your jeep when it's fully loaded up it's a good question i get asked this quite a bit it's 2300 kilos with a full tank of fuel and me on board with the camp gear in and that's just me on board not my wife and son so obviously when they're on board it's going to be a little bit heavier but uh basically that's pretty heavy for a cherokee i think in the world of overland vehicles it's not that heavy but then you've got to think a cherokee isn't that heavy to begin with they're about 1600 kilos so in in the class of cherokees this is really the top end in terms of weight, I think. I have had comments in the past about this being a kind of particularly bad overland vehicle because it doesn't need to be on 35s. I think those people aren't driving snow and they're not doing flotation work. In fact, on flotation snow, an even bigger tire is really required for this weight of vehicle in the kind of snow conditions I'm on. You'd, you'd actually probably want like a 40 with the kind of snow I do here, like, like one of those like Nokia, whatever they're called, Hakapalita 44 mega tires that when you air them down, you've got like a meter on each tire of flotation. That's, that's what you see people really doing, you know, in, in this, you know, in this climate, basically. Um, I couldn't get away with that. I'd just be breaking shafts and blowing up spider gears because of my front axle there. And I also don't want to go down that road anyway. It's very expensive and I just don't think you know, for me, it just doesn't really work. The vehicle I've built here is kind of like a jack of all trades and a master of none. You know, it can do it all, but it can't do everything perfectly. You know, it's a great overlander, but it's also not a brilliant overlander because of the bigger tire size that's affecting the fuel economy um, and the weight as well of the vehicle. You know, it can be done much lighter in a Cherokee class of, vi of vehicle as an overlander. In the summer in Sweden, anything bigger than a 31 isn't necessary. A two inch lift, 31s, yeah, you could do frame stiffeners and stuff for a less noisy ride. I would personally, and I might do it on that four litre as well. But, you know, you wouldn't even need a roof tent if you're traveling alone. You know, maybe you could just have a ground tent. You could do a real lightweight basic setup and just keep the vehicle super econ economical. Um, and, uh, and it would be, it would you wouldn't need it like mine you know i've built my vehicle the way it is for me and it is one way of doing it but it isn't the best way of doing it but when you're looking at an environment where you've got snow and you do a lot of winter work this works really well although arguably if i didn't have the family on board at certain times of year would i need a roof tent no 
I could just sleep in the vehicle or just use a ground tent, which I used to do. So, you know, there's a lot of debate there, but you know, you can always ask me in the comments section if you want something to be explained in the next Q&A, or maybe you want to give me some suggestions on that. Yeah, come to Sweden and experience the flies first before you knock a roof tent, is all I'll say to you. Ali Nistubbed, I think, says, just wondering if you've had any experience with driving snow in your headlights yet. Do they get hot enough to melt the snow? Um, does it build up on them? Um, what I will say is I've been running these now all winter and they do not get hot enough to melt snow. Yeah, my, my recommendation would be they look great and I love them, but they do not get hot enough to melt snow. And if that's a problem for you, do not buy them because it's going to be sketchy. Amedio Perry 3571, nice video and location. A question, is the 2.5 VM diesel reliable? A simple answer to that is my engine is reliable. Um, if you were to buy a VM diesel Cherokee that had been neglected and was fairly old, then perhaps the engine wouldn't be that reliable. It really depends. Like Reliability comes down to a lot of different factors. I, I mean, you know, I'm pushing quite a lot more power out of mine and it performs really well. You know, I've got a manual pump, I've tuned the pump up as best I can and adjusted the timing, the max fuel screw, the star wheel, the fuel pin, made sure my injectors are working great with new nozzles and stuff and put a different manifold and turbo on and it's taken me about a year and a half to get to a point where the engine's pulling really well. It's using a lot more fuel now, I'll, I'll tell you that, but you know, it's producing really good torque and that torque comes in from like 1,500 RPM all the way up to about 2,300. I can soar along the motorway at 110 kilometers an hour, fully loaded with the family on board, pulling up hills, you know, and, and, I, and I don't see overheating or temperature issues. My coolant temperatures are very stable. You know, I'm not seeing temperature spikes and things like that. And, uh, you know, my EGTs are really stable too. I've got good diagnostic gauges. So I've got an EGT gauge, I've got a boost gauge, I've got an analog oil pressure gauge, and I've got an oil temperature gauge. You know, those diagnostic gauges are there to tell me how the engine's doing and is it healthy? And when something goes wrong, and if something goes wrong, like as what's happened in the past, so a, a cool, uh, an intercooler, a charge pipe coupling gave way and blew, I could see it on the boost gauge already. I, 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 sudden, I, I lost power, my EGT spiked, my boost gauge was telling me not a lot of boost was going in and everything was feeling a bit off. So I pulled over straight away and saw the problem. Perhaps if I wasn't too clued up about how engines worked or, or hadn't worked on my own engine and that happened to me, I didn't have the diagnostic gauges like anyone naturally would have, they would have gone, what the hell's wrong with this thing? And they would have just put their foot down even more. And they wouldn't have known what those temps was, would be doing, but maybe those EGTs would have just skyrocketed. So when someone says to me, is the engine reliable? Well, what, what if, yeah, it can be really reliable, but it just depends how well maintained it is. You know, if you're one of these people, you get a radiator hose and you put it on onto something and then you tighten the hose clamp up, like to the point where the hose is like that being choked out you know, and, and then it breaks under temperature. No, the engine's gonna be unreliable and you might warp the block. And the stock engine coolant sensor on this, which tells you the volume, whether the coolant level is low, is so shit that you probably wouldn't know. And you'd be going down the motorway at like 80 miles per hour, all your coolant would have drained out and you would have cracked ahead or warped the block. Is that bad reliability? Probably not. It's just somebody who doesn't really understand how tight a hose clamp should be and has killed the engine so the only the only things really i'm going to do to the diesel now really getting off the topic of the engine is i've got an e-locker coming for next winter i'm really interested to see how that e-locker performs um, and maybe some cv ax axles as well on that so um yeah that's really the end of this q a I, I suppose i could answer a lot of other questions but that would kind of take the fun out of what you might ask me in the description. This is gonna be quite a long video. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a bit of a different video, but the problem is, is I'm like, I don't really have anything to do right now with regards to content on the channel. I'm in between projects. I'm waiting for parts of the four liter. I'm waiting for my locker for this vehicle. Once the locker's in this, I take the spider gears out of that. They go in the four liter. 
and then that's drivable that comes in here and then the fun starts really and the engine gets pulled to bits i put the new harmonic balancer on you know and i go through the motions of getting that engine singing and uh, and then it's rust work on the four liter i'm excited about the four liter and so is megan you know she wants her own little adventure vehicle um, we've potentially got a family roof tent coming for this diesel that is actually the same weight as the one I've got up there now. Um, a similar weight anyway, not, not really a lot more, just a few kilos. So that, that's cool. And then maybe that roof tent goes on the four litre, I don't know. It depends what she wants to do with it, you know. She's excited, but 31s and a two inch lift is, is a must, I think, for kind of the stuff she wants to do. So there's a lot coming up anyway in terms of content. Um, and uh, hopefully you all enjoy it. And if you do want to see me work on the Arctic Cat, right below, and I will do. Um, it's going to be in here next week. I'm just going to take some time out to check what went wrong on the gearbox. I think it's going to be a broken chain and a lot of other damage. I'm going to have to get some parts ordered locally at the snowmobile shop and um, yeah, get that fixed up. But when that's working, it's. I think I'm going to take it out on a camp. I mean, I'm going to deck the back out with some panniers and some other gear just take it out on a little camp because it allows you to do things that um, obviously you can't do with the vehicle like this, but the season's kind of coming to an end now anyway, really. So it'll be for next winter. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. I've yammered on once again. Hopefully I've included enough B-roll in this to make it interesting, but appreciate it. So um, yeah, I'll see you again in another video. Take care.